Good morning, everyone. I know many of you are joining us from our summer virtual programs. Um, so thanks for tuning in this morning. And then we also welcome anyone that's joining us on Facebook or through other platforms. We're glad to have you guys. Um, we have Miss Jenny Merrill from the Southern um, Food and Beverage Museum right here in New Orleans. And she has a quick little tutorial recipe workshop that she's going to do with everyone. Um, and she's actually picked out a recipe that um, is from the 1940s era and it's ration friendly, meaning it doesn't use a lot of those ingredients that, um, that were rationed during World War II. So things like sugar, butter, um, bacon, other meats, I could go on and on. Um, but without further ado, I am gonna pass it off to Jenny and let her get started. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny Merrill. Thank you so much, Bailey, and thank you, Chrissy, um, for those introductions. Um, again, I'm really excited to be here. I do a lot of cooking with kids. That's actually what I do for my job. Um, I'm here at home. I'm not at the museum currently. Um, so you might see the light affect this a little bit, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along very easily. And you can ask any questions, of course. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. You're going to have your apple right here and what you want to do is you are going to make a cone you're going to carve out the center sometimes you do with this with hiking snacks um, and you could put peanut butter or trail mix in there so when you're doing this it's kind of tricky because you want to make sure you're always cutting away from yourself and you want to go at an angle like carving a pumpkin you know if you carve at an angle more light will come through instead of going straight so like this at an angle and I'm going to start cutting like a pumpkin all the way around. You want to get a relatively small knife and I'm actually now just spinning mine which is pretty great I didn't know it could do that. Um, there we go and once you get around again always carving outside of yourself wiggle the top or get a spoon this spoon and you're just going to stick it in there and carve around, pop it out. My dog's going to really love that. That just happened. Okay, so here's what it looks like. It's kind of indented right now. I need to go even further because the seeds are in the middle and we don't need that. So with your spoon, now you just start carving it around like this. And remember, you want to get kind of a cylinder or a cone shape. Once you start seeing the guts and the seeds, that's a good thing. You want to go below it still. It looks like a star, which is pretty lovely. There. So keep carving. Yep, I broke mine a little bit. Just like a pumpkin. Carve it out. All right. You don't want to go all the way to the bottom. You don't want to hole all the way through. Otherwise, you could just use a core, like a tool. You don't want to do that. So once you start seeing what we call the blossom right down here, and you see that on top, then you want to stop. <clears throat> all right, all sorts of apple peelings. Suki's going to go crazy. Next part, super simple. We have maple syrup. I have craisins today, and then pecans. So I wanna take a couple seconds to talk to you about these kind of combinations. <clears throat> um, maple syrup, honey, those were natural, regional ways to get sugar um, when it was not very easy for people to get some. You know, you saw people using molasses, different types of sugar byproduct that were cheaper. But maple syrup, this would have been particularly used up north also where you would have been able to get apples. And you would have seen things like uh, walnuts, pecans, and then raisins would have been a traditional way of doing things as well. Because if you had access to grapes, which not everyone did, but raisins, in this version craisins, would have been the preserving way to keep them around. Um, kind of like how you would just have it to get over the winter. I chose pecans today very specifically, and you can break these apart so easily with your hands, because we're here in New Orleans and pecans are a huge, huge part 
of our culture. We have them in pralines. Um, they grow pretty prevalently just out on the trees and people could shake them and they would all fall down. So during hard times, in times where we're rationing, a lot of times you would just use what was growing around and pecan trees were really prevalent. So we are using pecans. Make sure that you've chopped them up a little bit, just like that. Again, you can do it with your hands. And then we are gonna fill this thing up. You know, I got a great question there on that Zoom chat. And the question is, what's my favorite thing to make with kids? I would say that my favorite thing to make with kids is pasta. We use pasta machines and we make it all from hand and then the kids roll it out. I think the coolest thing is most people, most adults haven't used to make pasta from scratch. Usually you just buy it um, already kind of hardened, dried out. Um, it's so much fun because seeing someone do something for the very first time and also, kids can totally roll pasta because it's mostly a machine and everything's by hand. So it's pretty easy to do. We just don't do it because it's easier to boil pasta from a box, but that's for another time. All right, so I have my apples already turning a little brown. I'm gonna put it in my baking dish. Next, what I'm going to do, I'm gonna put a dab of maple syrup in here, probably about one teaspoon. You want to fill it up about a third of the way. Then I'm going to sprinkle in some of my pecans. I'm going to push them down. Then I'm going to take some of my craisins. You could also mix this in a bowl ahead of time and just pour it in with a spatula. That's actually what I have you do in the recipe. Um, however, I didn't do it that way today. And then you're going to top it all the way to the top with maple syrup. So I'm gonna come and try and show you what this looks like. Right there. So you see how you can still see the cusp? That's because what's gonna happen is when you bake it, it is going to smoosh down. And so if you fill it all the way up, it's gonna spill over. So, right now, I have an oven set for 350 over there. Once your oven has preheated to 350, you're basically ready to go. I have my apple, syrup, nuts. It can be any nut. I wouldn't say pistachios necessarily. Those might be a little weird. Or maybe any like sunflower seeds, but why not try? I don't know. Maybe it's going to be awesome and nobody tries it because they just don't think it's going to be good. And so we have in our apple, we've cored our apple. Three ingredients. We have our maple syrup, right here. And that would have been our sugar substitute because we couldn't have been able to get sugar as easily or we would have saved it for a really special occasion if we were at war or we would have combined our ration cards with community members. So this is our syrup and then we are using pecans. Again, you can use any nut for the most part. We're using pecans because it's so prevalent in New Orleans cuisine and we are going to also we added craisins and those are dried cranberries so go ahead stick it in your baking dish and we are going to be covering this up first i want to add a little water in here into my baking dish just a little bit this is going to steam it cover it with tin foil and I got this recipe from the Illinois Digital Archives, just as a heads up. Now I'm going to stick this in the oven at 350 degrees for 45 minutes. The recipe has four apples. I'm just doing one right now. And movie magic! It's out of the oven. Wow, those 45 minutes flew by. And here we are. Be aware, it doesn't look that pretty. <laughs> it's not going to, but it's gonna taste really great. It's a little hot. You know, you don't have to put water at the bottom. You could also use apple juice or apple um, cider, not apple cider vinegar. But this is, I'm gonna try and lift it a little bit. This is what it looks like right there. And you see, you can just pierce it like that. Yes, I'm gonna try a bite. 
Oh wow, that's great. It's like, it kind of tastes like oatmeal. It tastes like the fall for sure. Mmm. So now you can make yours too, which is pretty great. Now I got a question on Facebook and I wanted to address it. And that was, um, did people in New Orleans start adding chicory to their coffee during World War II as a substitute because coffee was rationed? That's a great question. And the answer is, it was already here. Chicory being added as a substitute or basically as a coffee extender. Let me describe what chicory is for those of you who might not know too. So what chicory is, is it's a kind of blue, cornflower blue flower. And you take the root and then you chop it up and you roast it with the coffee. And it kind of emulates coffee so you can extend it for, uh, especially during economic difficulties, during war, during rationing. It allows you to have coffee because it's close enough to the flavor. Now, most places do not continue using chicory in their coffee after times of struggle because it's not, you know, if you're not used to the taste, it's not your favorite. New Orleans is one of those exceptions. We definitely have chicory. In fact, most of our old coffee establishments, chicory is the coffee that you would be receiving if you got, say, a cafe au lait. Um, the other place I've seen it is Pittsburgh, actually. Um, and again, that might be economic. Um, you know, when you start to, when you have a history of economic strength and you get used to those things and you can grow it, um, you just kind of add it into your diet. That's how a lot of foods, particularly in the South, were created. Now, the French actually started making, uh, adding chicory. So that practice came over with them. And it started before the Civil War, but it was really ingratiated into uh, Louisiana culture during that time period. So we absolutely used chicory during World War II, but we were already ready for it because we were already using it. And I got another question. These are so great. From Facebook, what were some of the most commonly rationed items from World War II? And did people grow their own foods since some foods were rationed? Absolutely. <laughs> so there's a couple of different things and I bet you guys can answer this too because I think you know right um if you grow up in an area that doesn't have seafood you're not going to be able to afford to get seafood imported you can only really afford what's in your area and it's the staple items specifically those pantry we call them pantry items or staple items we're kind of in that time right now. So when we were in quarantine, when we started staying at home, you couldn't find toilet paper, you couldn't find bread, it was hard to find eggs. Those are things that are now staple ingredients for you and I, right? However, back in the time, in, in during World War II, you had a lot more people who had their own chickens. They had access to farmland. They had fruit trees that grew in their backyard. Um, they would have made their own bread. They were closer to the time when people did that instead of bought it. They didn't have as necessarily all these giant supermarkets. Those were just starting to happen and really boomed post-World War II. So when you go to Rouse's, that giant supermarket with the lights, this, you know, up above, that's relatively new. We didn't have that until really a lot more after World War II. So what people did is you had to depend on your community. So if you were in New Orleans, you would have been eating seafood and it would have been something that would have been, including during the depression, which was before World War II, you would have been eating things that were natural. Now, if I was in uh, Illinois and I wanted to have shrimp, well, it would have been insanely expensive. And during World War II, it really wouldn't have been logical. I wouldn't have been able to eat shrimp. So something like in Maine, you could eat all the lobster you wanted because it was prevalent, but if that's not where you came from, it would have been too expensive. So we had a lot more regional foods where people were growing their own, and people were also a little bit closer to making their own things like bread. All right, so um, I love the fact that we do people grow their own food. My grandma, just a little fun part about her, um, had an orchard full of fruit trees, and the only reason I think that it kind of traces down, right? It's like, I now cook with kids because years ago, she taught my mom how to cook. 
and they made apple butter together. You know, she canned everything. To be fair, she cooked the, the stuffing out of a lot of foods and it didn't always taste great, but she loved to can. Um, one more thing, just to remind how much water and or apple cider um, or apple juice in the bottom, you're gonna wanna do probably about a fourth cup. Yeah, a fourth cup. Just enough to have like say a quarter of an inch at the bottom because it's going to steam. And then it's gonna add more at the bottom as well. So I wanna take a second too to tell you about what we do with SoFab Kids at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. So we have a summer camp of our own um, and we it's a cooking camp. And it's not what you think, it's, or who knows what you think, but um, it's definitely Lean's fun. You know, we play food games like Snack Wars and Chopped, and we make a dish every, and every week has a theme, um, which is pretty fun. So then, you know, you can costume up a little bit and get to uh, learn how to make foods with, um, with some of your best friends. Um, the other thing we do during the school year is we have kids in the kitchen and those are weekend programs. So you come to the museum on a Saturday or a Sunday from 10 to 11.30. And then uh, we, you pick which dish. So we have a whole list called Kids in the Kitchen. If you're 7 to 11, that's your standard Kids in the Kitchen. If you're 11 to 14, those are our master classes. So 11 to 14 year olds master class, it's not that you have to have all this technical skill. What it means is that I bring in professionals, culinary professionals, to teach you how to do what they do a little better. So um, right during, right before uh, coronavirus, we actually, um, we, we had Chef Chaya of Bywater Bakery who was coming. Um, we have, we've done sushi. We have a lot of cake decorating, like making fondant characters and everyone gets a cake that they get to learn how to decorate from people. So those are more of our master classes. And for our seven to 11 year olds, um, we'll do things like, we, were, we did crawfish bread and mango freeze, so Jazz Fest favorites. Um, fried chicken and fruit salad uh, was another one. Yep, so we do a lot of fun cooking things. I don't stray away from having you guys fry or do grilling, things like that. I'm just making sure I'm watching and teaching you how to do it the best way possible. So this has gone in. I'd love to find out too, if you wanna email me at Jenny, J-E-N-N-I-E, at southernfood.org. Um, feel free to email me any questions about this dish, if you have any questions in general about our programs. Um, we also have a YouTube channel now where I picked a whole bunch of dishes and made them right here with this background. <laughs> and that YouTube channel is called SoFab Kids. I bet you could probably figure that out. There's also an exclamation point on it, so you might have to add that in there too. I would love to answer any more of your questions. Otherwise, I'm just gonna eat all of this apple and that's gonna be my morning. Do you have um, a question about um, your um, summer camp programs? Do you have any spots that are available that people can register for? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So we do have some spots a little bit later on in the summer. Our August sessions are still pretty open, and I think we have a couple spots in July. And these are in-person camps. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a little different, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and lots of, uh, lots of fun food crafts and history and best of all eating, which is my favorite part. But yes, we do have a couple of spots open. Awesome. All right. So anybody that is watching from home, either through Zoom or on Facebook, um, you'll be able to see in our Zoom chat the link to Jenny's programs that she's talking about, um, which I'm sure will take you to registration for camp if you're interested uh, in that. Um, and um, we've also, we'll also have that on Facebook for you guys to check out too. Um, let's see, Jenny, we have one more question. Um, do you have any more virtual programs? We have someone watching from Philadelphia. Yeah, that is fantastic. How are you guys doing there? Um, that's funny because we mentioned Pittsburgh of all the places. <laughs> you know, obviously not always the same, but um, 
Yes, so we are going to be trying to do some a little bit further um, camp. Got to get through camp before we do more live cooking demos. Um, we do have the SoFab YouTube channel, SoFab Kids. There's a whole bunch of um, videos up there. And then it's link. There's a link to go to our website, which has the recipe and activity and an exit ticket. So you can actually turn it into a lesson. And, um, you know, if you're looking for something that might be fun, but also um, have a little bit of structure to it, you can basically either watch it and make it that way, or you can go the full nine yards and you can um, do all the programming. Mostly with virtual programming, I've been doing this with other people in a partnership. But if you follow us on Facebook, um, I we usually post or tags and you can um, join in. Like I gave, a lecture about the Irish influence on Southern food about two weeks ago. And while it wasn't a cooking demo, it was definitely kid friendly, minus all the information about whiskey. But um, those things are posted on our Facebook that you can follow. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions from anyone. Um, so Jenny, do you have anything else you want to add before we sign off? No, thank you so much for coming. It was a lot of fun. I hope you make this. I love to see pictures if you did. Feel free to reach out. And um, so glad you guys uh, joined, took your time today. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and I'll reiterate what Jenny said. We thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, we appreciate all your questions and your interaction. And uh, we hope to see you guys next week. We'll be, uh, we'll be here with another uh, community partner going live uh, at 11 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. Um, but we hope that you guys will join us and check out the other virtual programming we have going on. Thanks, everybody.